that God's going to speak to you through his word. Paul the Apostle writing to Titus says, Remind them, that's the Christians on the island of Crete, Remind them to be subject to rulers and authorities, to obey, to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, to be peaceable, gentle, showing all humility to all men. For we ourselves were also once foolish, disobedience, deceived, serving various lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But when the kindness and the love of God our Savior towards man appeared, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior. And having been justified by his grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. This is a faithful saying. And these things I want you to affirm constantly that those who have believed in God should be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable to men. You may be seated. Again, as the Apostle Paul closes out this letter to, to Titus, he is reiterating some of the things that he has already mentioned, and he is putting a kind of an exclamation mark on the important items. He is wanting Titus to, he says, remember, refer, affirm constantly. That's kind of the theme that runs through this chapter. And I found a wonderful little illustration that points that out as we have things brought to our remembrance from the word of God. The story is told of an old man who lived on a farm in the mountains with his grandson. Each morning, Grandpa would rise early in the morning, sit at the kitchen table, and would read his worn-out Bible. His grandson, who wanted to be just like him, tried to imitate him in any way that he could. But one day, the grandson said to his grandfather, Papa, I try to read the Bible just like you, but I don't understand it. And what I do understand, I forget as soon as I close the book. So what good does it do to read the Bible? The grandfather quietly turned from putting coal into the stove and said, Take this coal basket, which was a weaved basket, down to the river and bring, it, bring back to me a basket of water. The boy did as he was told, even though all the water leaked out before he could get back to the house. The grandfather, smiling, said, You'll have to run a little faster than that next time. And he sent him back to the river with the same basket to try again. But again, the basket was empty by the time he reached the door. Out of breath, he told his grandfather that it was impossible to carry water in a basket and a waste of time. The old man insisted, I don't want a bucket of water. I want a basket of water. Go one more time. And I will tell you why. At this point, the boy knew it was impossible, but his grandfather asked, and he was willing to do it again. The boy scooped up water, and he ran as hard as he could. But when he reached his grandfather, the water had leaked out of the basket one more time, and it was empty. See, Papa? It's useless. The old man said, You may not have water, but look at the difference in the basket. The boy looked down to see that instead of a dirty, soot-covered, cold basket, it was now clean. Son, that's what happens when you read the Bible. You might not understand or remember everything, but when you read it, it will change you from the inside out, slowly but surely changing us more into the image of Jesus. 
And so Paul the Apostle is telling Titus, remember these things, constantly affirm them. In fact, it was even Peter who said the following in 2 Peter 1.12. Therefore, Peter says, I will always remind you about these things, even though you already know them and are standing firm in the truth you have been taught. Personally, I kind of look at the word of God as on a scale. And I think to myself, how much of the world have I taken in today? How much negativity have I taken in today? And I look at that and I think, oh my gosh, the world is just beating me up. <laughs> and it weighs heavy. And my worries weigh heavy. But then I put the word of God on the other side of it. And I let the word of God become heavier than the things that I may face in life. So I continually will remind you of these things. And so our verses begin with a reminder. Uh, one that says how we are to act towards authority here on earth. And I want us to understand that the reason why Paul would ask us to obey authorities here on earth is because it is a reflection of how we treat the one true authority in heaven. One of the things that we are doing as Christians is to live a life to please the unseen authority. That would be God in heaven. Not only are we to live to please the unseen authority, but we are also to ask other people, please come and follow the unseen authority. Here's how the thinking then goes. How can we expect folks to submit to an authority that they cannot see God in heaven if we Christians are not willing to submit to human authority on earth that we can see in a real sense we are citizens of two kingdoms aren't we where's your citizenship Christian it's in heaven our citizenship is in heaven looking for a home just like Abraham way back when looking for a home whose builder and maker is God. We are citizens of heaven, but we are also citizens of the kingdom of men. And it is our job to obey both the law of the Lord and the law of the land. Now you may ask, well, when, if ever, is it possible to disobey the law of the land? Easy. Whenever it contradicts the law of God. If you remember the disciples said in the book of Acts, my goodness, we ought better to obey God than to obey men. And that's the one place where we can say no to this world. Paul then writes to Titus to remind the church to be ready. So let me say it to you. Church, I want you to be ready for every good work. And I want you to be sure that you don't speak evil of anyone. Now, didn't your mom even tell you that? If you can't say anything good about somebody, <laughs> see, you've got it. And I, I, I think and I, I look at the church and the church should always be looking for good things to do. That's for sure. And we should always stay on guard that this would be a gossip free zone. You like that? Maybe I'll have a little sign put up. Gossip free zone. No gossiping. As gossip with a circle and a walk through it. It was John Wesley who said, I know you've heard me quote this before, but I, it's probably my favorite John Wesley quote. It's a way to live. Do all the good you can, by all the means you can, in all the ways you can, in all the places you can, uh, at all the times you can, to all the people you can, as long as ever you can. Let that be known of you. Now remember that we have already been told that the Cretans on this beautiful Mediterranean island, these Cretans are a rough bunch. I don't know. I, I would encourage you again sometime after service, uh, Google Cretans and see what people have written about them in history. They were just a rowdy bunch. They were just, you know, no authority, no control. Well, some of these Cretans started getting saved. It's kind of when I look at myself and consider my own life. My goodness, it's kind of like this. If I can get saved, anybody can get saved. And look at the Cretans. If the Cretans can get saved, 
anybody can get saved. Well, they're a rough bunch. And yet they are, yet the reminder they are given for, for good works and to, at times button our lip is really good for all of us, any place, in any situation, at any time. Right? How many times have you said something and, boy, once you say something, what? There's no pulling it back, is it? It's like McGee said, once the horses are let out of the barn, there's no good, it does no good to shut the barn doors, you know what I mean? So verse 2 says, at, towards the end, you might want to take a look at it, it says, be peaceable, gentle, showing all humility to all men. Is that a picture of you? Somebody said, what do you like? They said, he's peaceable, gentle. She shows all humility to all men. It really is a tall order. Especially if you've had a bad day. Isn't it? I mean, it's okay to do some of these things when things are going good. But boy, if you've had a bad day, if somebody cuts you off or... <clears throat> here's one. You go through the drive through You have to wrestle with the gal to get her to understand your order. No, that's extra pickles. No, 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 that's... <laughs> and back and forth you go. Then you pay and you pick up the bag and you leave and you get home and what? It's not even your order. <laughs> it's tough to be peaceable at that time, isn't it? <laughs> or, or when you're struggling with something. Or when somebody says something against you. That's a real hard one, huh? And you're not quite sure what to do. You want to be like Jesus. And you're like struggling. Is this one of those times when I was supposed to stand up for my rights? Or is this one of those times when I take it on the chin and I turn the other cheek? Oh, Lord, give me wisdom. You see, look at the first word that's uh, in verse 3. Is it in verse 3? It says, what's the first word in verse 3? Four. That's a very helpful word. <laughs> Let me tell you why. It says, be peaceable, gentle, showing all all humility to all men. For is a reason word. It's a because word. So do these things for we ourselves were once foolish. You ever been foolish? Oh my goodness, you were very quiet when I asked that. <laughs> Disobedient. Deceived. <clears throat> serving various lusts and pleasures. Living in malice envy, hateful and hating one another. Do you know that Jesus said hatred just like murder? Anger is just like murder? But here's the picture that we're being given here. Well, first let me ask this. Anybody here perfect when God first called them to serve him? <laughs> okay. Anybody here perfect now? Okay. Good. It's hard to get a big head when we remember what we were before we came to Christ, when we consider what following Christ has put an end to in our own lives. Just consider that for a moment. John Wesley also wrote, we should be rigorous in judging ourselves and gracious in judging others. That really captures the idea and the thinking of what Christ has forgiven you of. Consider this. It's not just that Christ has forgiven you. I mean, that'd be great if he's like, all right, I'll overlook that one, you know, because of my son. It, it goes beyond that. His forgiveness of you on the count of the cross is so thorough and so complete he doesn't even remember what you did. Okay, I don't know how that works. But sovereignly, God in his infinite power, knowledge, and presence decides on account of your faith in his son, I won't remember a single stinking thing that you did. You're just like, Lord. It just all, of a, all at once, it fills you with, with this uh, gratitude 
It's like, you, it's, if you're like me at all, don't you want to say at some point, are you serious? I don't, I don't know anybody like you. And God says, there is nobody like me. That whatever the penalty, whatever the price, whatever the cost that God would have you with him, he was willing to pay in Christ. I will not be apart from you, is what God is saying. I will not leave you. I will not end my relationship with you, but I will make it possible for you to stand before me and me not see a single sin. <laughs> oh my gosh, Lord. I don't know if that breaks your heart. It breaks my heart, Lord. It's like, it's like I want to go, does he understand what he's getting when he, when he got me? Does, does he really know? He does. And Paul is saying, we need to be continually, I need to be continually reminded of the gospel. Just how the gospel works. Over and over, I want to hear it. Over and over again, I want to enjoy it and I want to contemplate it. God has forgiven me. Someone has said, uh, we may not have once been like Attila the Hun or Darth Vader, but it's not for the lack of potential. <laughs> I had every possibility. I was bad enough as it is, but I could have been way worse. And yet God has forgiven and God has called you to a new life. Oh man, I want that new life. Because we have been rescued from our old life. We have been rescued from the dead end of our own passions. They're no longer in charge of us. They no longer have to run amok. I no longer have to obey my lusts. There's a commercial out that talks about, uh, what's that commercial that says, obey your thirst? Mountain Dew, <laughs> obey your thirst. You have a lot of thirsts, don't you? We all have a lot of thirsts, but they're not under God con God's control unless I submit that to the Lord. And then I no longer have to be ruled over by it. Oh, that's a beautiful, that's a beautiful hope. That's a beautiful truth, a beautiful reality that you and I can have in our lives. Okay, God, set me free. I mean it. Set me free. Lord, do it. And like the little boy with the basket, I continually intake the word of God because Jesus said, now you are clean by the word that I have spoken unto you. Oh, you may have come in here today feeling a little dirty. Maybe you're a little convicted. When you begin to talk about the love of God and his great forgiveness for us and the penalty Christ paid, sometimes you can, you oh boy, you know, Lord, I need to be forgiven. Awesome. Glad you're here. God wants to forgive you. Verse 4 says, when the kindness, here it is, we were living in our own selfish world, but when the kindness and the love of God our Savior, that tells me that Jesus is God right there. I don't know if you catch that, Bible students. But when the kindness and love of God our Savior towards man appeared, I was like Jesus came on the scene. All was lost. He's the rescue. <laughs> He's the search and rescue team that showed up just in the nick of time. He brought grace with him. Oh my goodness, Jesus could stand before any one of us. Oh, he could stand in front of me and he could say, he could say, I know what you're up to. I know what you're doing. I know what you're thinking. I know where you've been. I know what you're going to do. Couldn't he? <laughs> but what does he do? He's like the woman that, he caught, that was caught in the act of adultery. He says, where are your accusers? She looked around. She didn't see any. I don't know where they are. And Jesus says, neither do I accuse you. Does that just break you? It just breaks me. Of all the things that I could be accused of in this world, or you perhaps. And yet God says to you, neither do I accuse you. Now go and sin no more. In other words, come on, let's live this new life that I have for you. I'm not going to hold that against you. As a matter of fact, me being God, I've sovereignly choose to forget it. I've removed your sins from you as far as the east is from the west. By the way, east and west never meet. And look how this happens, verse 5. Not by works of righteousness. How do people get into heaven? 
I mean, we could probably go up and down the streets here. How do you think people get into heaven? Gospel news reporter here. How do you think you get into heaven? I'm taking a survey. How do you think you get into heaven? I think 99% of the people would say, be good. <laughs> if you're good enough, you can get into heaven. Problem is, what? Nobody's good enough. Nobody stands up to the measure and the level of the holiness of Christ. So, wow, we, what have we got left then? Since it's not by works of righteousness, I cannot earn my way into heaven. It's not by works of righteousness which we have done. I'll tell you, you can buy all the stained glass windows for churches that you want. You could buy all the new carpeting. You could tithe every single week. You could, uh, I don't know, give to the poor everything that you have. You could, I don't know what. It's not enough. It doesn't pay for sins. Only Christ pays for sins. It's not by works of righteousness which we have done. But according to his mercy, he saved us. Who saved us? It doesn't say we saved ourselves. It says he saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. Boy, sometimes I just think to myself, Lord, not only did you wipe away my past, but now I'm rich in you. I've got you to go to. My goodness, what do people do in life that don't have Christ to go to? No wonder there's so many people taking Xanax and <laughs> to antidepressants and <laughs> I got something better than a pill I got Jesus to go to I don't have to struggle with things because I know that all things work together for the good to those who love God to those who are the called according to his purpose I know that he's promised to provide for me he says I see every bird there's not a bird that falls out of the sky that I don't know it already Look at the lilies of the valley. They're dressed nicer than Armani. I mean, uh, what's his name? Solomon. <laughs> They're dressed nicer than Solomon. And all his glory was never arrayed as what I would do to a field that nobody even ever sees. Don't you think I can take care of you? Oh, you of little faith. Don't you know that I gave my son for you? Oh, you of little faith. If you believe that I can take care of this universe and keep the stars in orbit, don't you think I can take care of you? It's not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. Our salvation is not based on our merit, but on his mercy. That's the only way we could get saved. That is so freeing, so humbling. And here's another thing. Don't let the enemy beat you up over your past. Has that ever happened to you? you do the enemy just wants to pound you you know, just with, because what, look, if you're going to, here's Satan, if you're going to play for the other team, I'm going to beat you up. <laughs> but Jesus says, not even the gates of hell will prevail against his bride, the church. You don't have to beat yourself up. Don't let the enemy do it. Here's what C.S. Lewis wrote, and I think it's one of the reasons why people say he's so smart. Take a look at this. Think about it for a moment. He once wrote, the real test of being in the presence of God, so am I in the presence of God, is that you either, one of the two, forget about yourself altogether, or you see yourself as a small, dirty object. It's better to forget about yourself altogether. <laughs> Isn't it? Sometimes I think of my smallness and the greatness of God, and I go, ah. Oh, Lord, oh, Satan reminds you of something you did, someplace you went, something you, you would never even do today or approach, and you're just beating yourself down with it. Hey, look, it's better just to get your mind off yourself. Years ago, we used to sing a song. I don't know if some of you remember it or not. Let's forget about ourselves, magnify the Lord, and worship him. 
That's it. Let's forget about ourselves. I mean, when I get in trouble, it's usually when I think about myself, <laughs> when I'm worried about myself, when all my concern is about myself. Oh my gosh, Lord, break me free from that and have me think on you. You're lovely. You're beautiful. Don't, do not carry the baggage that Christ has paid for. He already paid for that. It's not carry on. <laughs> Christ paid for that baggage. He's forgiven you. Get on to putting your eyes on Jesus and following close to him and serving him rather than serving yourself. Jesus has done all the heavy lifting for your past. It is gone. It is buried. It is thrown into the sea of forgetfulness. So don't you remember it either. Verse 5 continues. Through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Here is what saves. Not what we do, but what Jesus did for us. And what the Spirit does in us. That is, being born again. Regeneration. Let me just give you a definition of that. Regeneration, only used twice in the Scriptures, the spiritual change brought about in a person's life by an act of God. In regeneration, a person's sinful nature is changed and replaced with a new nature. And Paul the Apostle calls it the washing of regeneration. Here's what I picture in my mind. And I want you to do the same. With my past, it's like the Holy Spirit got a hold of a giant fire hose from heaven. And he whoosh, put on the power and he sprayed every bit of the dirt of this world off of you. Who, when they first gave their lives to Christ here, felt this tremendous weight off their shoulders? We got any of those? It was like, oh my gosh, what, did, what just happened to me? Oh my gosh, I'm free. But as time goes by, all of a sudden you're weighed down again. Why is that? I think one of the reasons is this. Christians, you know that you're saved by grace through faith, and that's it. Faith in Christ alone saves you. Faith in Christ alone forgives your sins. And that brings such freedom. But somewhere along the line, you come up with this hybrid of salvation. And the hybrid of salvation says... A little bit of faith and a little bit of works. That's not how it works. It's always by grace through faith alone that you are saved, that you're forgiven. And that's what God wants us to be free to serve him. Someone has written, as a Christian, I'm not only cleansed, I no longer want to get dirty. And when I do, I'm quick to repent. Amen. Verse 7 continues the thought that having been justified by his grace, we should become heirs. Wouldn't you like to get a phone call and say, you're an heir. You've been listed on somebody's will. Wouldn't you like that? I'd like that. Not one of those fake ones from you know, India or wherever those, <laughs> wherever those fake ones come out on the internet, you know? <laughs> yes, I, you know, anyway. Uh, uh, but this is a real one. You get the call and it says, calling to inform you that you are an heir on a will. And you go, this is awesome. Who, who, whose will am I on? You're on Jesus' will. He says, whatever I've got now belongs to you. You're an heir. Why should I worry about what I get or don't get in this world or where I am in this world or not in this world or where I think I should have come to? My goodness, I'm an heir! <laughs> you see all these crazy people who win the lotto? Five million dollars, they look so happy. What's five million dollars compared to or 50 million or 100 million or 150 million compared to eternal life with Christ? Oh my goodness. Verse 7 continues that thought. Having been justified by his grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Uh, 
so I'm regenerated and I am uh, justified. I'm washed off with the fire hose of the Holy Spirit and I am justified. And that word justified speaks to how God treats us. Here it is, justified, just as if I'd never sinned. It's a beautiful word, justified in Christ. And even when I do, and that, my friends, is grace, is amazing grace. Verse 8 uh, is another reminder. This is a faithful saying that these things I want you to affirm constantly. Okay, we'll affirm these constantly. That those who have believed in God should be careful to maintain good works. He just keeps going over and over that, doesn't he? He says the church needs to hear this over and over again. That none of us are saved by good works, but we are all saved to good works. Titus, teach these things because they are good. They are profitable to men. But avoid foolish disputes, genealogies, contentions, and strivings about the law, for they are unprofitable and useless. Church, just, let's just stay focused on the grace of God, shall we? The grace of God, the goodness of God, the love of God. Let's put all of our intentions upon Jesus and what he has done for us. Here's how I like to put it. Major on the majors and minor on the minors. There you go. And then another very strong word for the church would be a, those who would be in a biblical church or be biblical leaders. Here's what he says. Reject a divisive man after the first and second admonitions. Knowing that such a person is, is warped and sinning, being self-condemned. Okay, this is the person who continually rejects obedience to the word of God, or is totally involved in gossip, or is insubordinate to the church leadership, or is involved in false teaching and wants to spread it to others. You've got to nip it in the bud. You've got to say, nope. We don't do that. The one who causes confusion and the one who causes division, the one who is perpetually contentious, reject that person and eject that person. Remember at the start of this teaching, I think it was in our first teaching in Titus, I said, a troublemaker is a person who rocks the boat and then convinces everyone else that there's a storm outside. I have a sense that the church on the island of Crete was full of these kinds of people. And that's why Paul was speaking so strongly. Someone was telling me last Sunday that on YouTube they saw a video. You can see some pretty crazy stuff on YouTube, can't you? They saw a video where there was a, a, a fight between an alligator and an electric eel. Very large alligator and a very large electric eel. And uh, who do you think won? They got in a fight, and they both died. The electric eel and the alligator. Now, what am I saying? Part of Christian discernment and maturity is knowing what things to fight about and fight for and what things just to let go and let God. we got to grow up in this church. To be mature, you got to pick your battles and know which ones are important and which ones to let go. Paul's remedy for a contentious person in the church is simple and straightforward. Warn that one twice, and if they don't change their ways, then send them on their way. And here is Paul's end of this letter to, title, to Titus with some personal issues. I think this just shows us that Paul was a real guy. Look what it says in verse 12. When I send Artemis to you, or Tychicus, be diligent to come to me at Nicopolis. That's a city on the Greek main, uh, mainland. For I have decided to spend the winter there. Send Zenus, the lawyer. Wait a minute. Lawyers can get saved? Okay. Somebody has said that it's the 99% of the lawyers that give the other 1% a bad name. Send Zenos the lawyer and Apollos, another preacher, on their journey with haste that they may lack nothing. 
And let our people also learn to maintain good works, to meet urgent needs, that they may not be unfruitful. Here's how to maintain an effective witness for Jesus. Do good works, meet urgent needs. And I'd like for you all to read verse 15 with me, would you? Here we go. Verse 15. All who are with me greet you. Greet those who love us in the faith. Grace be with you all. Amen. Grace was at the opening of this letter, and grace is at the end of this letter. This little three-chapter book is quite a jewel, wouldn't you say? Beautiful things that are in here. can hardly wait to see Titus. I'll, I'll say to him, Titus, loved your book, bro. <laughs> when we meet him in heaven. Tell me again about those Cretans. How bad were they? <laughs> well, God is good to us. And he feeds us his word. And as we continue in his word, we're continually washed from the inside out. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this morning. And I thank you, Father, that you have brought us your word. And I pray, Heavenly Father, that your word would be effective in the lives of everyone here. I pray, Heavenly Father, that the truths that were heard this day would stick to our hearts like glue and that they would produce good fruit. I pray, Father, that this would not have been just an exercise in listening to a lecture, but instead, Father, as true disciples of Jesus Christ, we will now take these truths, apply them to our lives, and pass them along to others. Father, I lift up before you here, everyone that's here. If you're here today and you've not given your life to Christ or you're unsure about where you'll spend eternity, I want you to settle that issue today. In fact, I'll ask Pastor Mike to come on up here. And as we close, if you need prayer for any reason at all, I want you to come up and ask Pastor Mike and the prayer team to pray for your needs. And I pray these things in Jesus' wonderful name and everybody says.